Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. Now, if you don't know who Jacob is, he is the son of Isaac. If you don't know who Isaac is, he is the son of Abraham. And I know that sounds like something that everyone should know, but I'm telling you, everyone doesn't know that. And so why is that important? Well, because Abraham was given the, made the covenant, God made a covenant with Abraham that his seed, his descendant, would, would forever, forever be, um, <coughs> excuse me, will forever be blessed. And, 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 uh, and so we know that the line of Jesus comes from that. And so um, that's very important. So Isaac, the son of Abraham, and Jacob, the son of Isaac, and he lived in his father's land. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, <coughs> was tending the flocks with his brothers and the son of Bela and the son of Zepha, his wife's, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Immediately, we, we see Joseph getting himself in trouble. <clears throat> now, Israel loved Joseph. Israel is Jacob. His name was changed by Isaac more than any, <clears throat> excuse me, his name was changed by God, uh, more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, meaning Rachel. He was born to him through Rachel. And he made an ordinate robe for him. Now, those of you who have been in church for a long time, that's, that's the, the coat of many colors. That might be familiar to you if we say that. But for, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for us today, it's just, it's just a very rich robe. You know, it's, it's like, it's like um, <clears throat> Prada, like... You're going to wear Prada or Gucci or something of that nature, and, and, and the rest of your children are going to wear Kmart. That's, that's, the, that's the equivalent there. Um, <clears throat> when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were excuse me, binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? <clears throat> Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream. <clears throat> then he had another dream and he told his told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars are bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept that in mind. Now his brothers and and now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. And then we skip down to verse 23. When Joseph became, excuse me, when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ordinate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern, which is a well, the well was empty. There was, a, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites <clears throat> coming from Galilee. Uh, their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will, it, what, will, what will we gain if we kill our brothers and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and, and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Mennonites uh, merchant came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the well and said and sold him to the tw for 20 shekels of silver to Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the well, he saw that Joseph was not there he tore his clothes. He went back to his father and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? And then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. 
They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Explain, examine to see whether it's your son's robe. And he recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal have devoured it. Joseph was surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned over his son. Whew, that's a lot of scripture. But there's context. We, we, I, you need it. I need it. And so now we all have a point of reference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. God, I pray as we <clears throat> learn from the life of Jacob and Joseph and his brothers, God, that the word you want to speak to us today would be evident. Lord, that we have ears as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We have spiritual ears that will listen, that would not turn away from your word, that would not turn away from what you have to share and teach us today. God, also that we would have the courage, Lord God, to apply what you want to teach us. Lord, that we won't just listen to the word, but God, we'll be doers of the word. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, faith doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't. Thank you. There's, there's, thank you so much. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, it doesn't have to make sense. It does not, although we feel like it does. I constantly, in, in my 20 plus years of, of ministry, I've always <clears throat> have people come to me and they say, are you ready? Are you going to take a picture? Hmm? All right. I don't, I don't know. He's taking a picture. So I, I, they always come to me and say, Pastor, why does this happen? Why, why is God allowing certain things to happen in my life? Right? We, we, we never come to the pastors or the counselors and we go, why is God allowing all these blessings? What's wrong with him? Like, I, I can't contain it. I don't know what to do with these blessings, Pastor. Come help me. Come help me understand what God's doing in my life. I mean, I turn one way, he's blessing me. I turn another way, he's blessing me. Oh, my goodness. Like, what do I do with these blessings? Have you ever had someone do that? No. Oh, we, we just like, man, God's blessing me, and we, and we just keep trucking, right? But when tragedy hits... When, when circumstances are beyond our control, when, when life, the, 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 the claws of life begin to crush us and they begin to squeeze what's inside, we come and we go, why is God allowing this to happen? Why is he doing this? It makes no sense to me. I'm a good person. I'm, I, I do what the Lord has asked me to do, right? Like, is he, is he mad at me? Does he not care? We feel that God's absent. We feel that, that our prayers go no further than the ceiling. There's no feeling of God. There's no sense of God in our life. And, we, and we're, just, we're just all wound up. And we're saying, where's God? Where's God in the midst of all this trouble, in the midst of all this pain I'm suffering? I'm here to tell you this morning that if you, if you would press into the narrative, if you would, just, if you would listen to what the Holy Spirit has for you today. From the life of Joseph, those questions can be answered. Your perspective on life can actually change today. Your perspective on how you see things, I believe, can absolutely radically change the way you serve God today. And so Joseph presents that kind of situation for us. His life is, is, is about to be a wreck. And he can, and, and you'll see as we journey through his life in the weeks to come, how God is in the midst of everything. <clears throat> so there's two things that I want you to get from Joseph today. The first thing is the unseen sin. The unseen sin. And the second thing that I want you to get is the unseen purposes of God. Those are the two things, and I'll be done in 10 minutes. That's good, right? I only have two things for you. You don't believe I can do it, do you? I don't believe I can do it either. I don't know why I say stuff like that. <clears throat> it's, so the first thing is the, the, the unseen depths of sin. It, when I started preparing this, this sermon, um, I was thinking about volcanoes. I was thinking about how, how volcanoes, they, from the outside, they, they're, they're some of the most stable images that we can, 
we can look at, right? So you take Mount St. Helens, for example, uh, before May 1980, right? She's, she's a beautiful mountain. She's a snow-capped mountain. I don't know if you've ever even driven up towards Colorado and the mountains of Colorado. It's gorgeous, right? And so you look at these mountains and you're like, there's nothing that could be more permanent, nothing that could be more stable than a mountain. Like, how does a mountain move? How, how does this thing even, even begin to shake, right? It's like, well, if you look at Mount St. Helen after May 16, 1980, that erupts. Doesn't look the same. Not even close. So what was permanent, what was stable as a mountain was actually unstable. It's kind of like the life of Joseph, the family of Jacob. From the outside, this family was large. I mean, I, I made the connection for you. They, they are the grandchildren of Abraham. This is the seed of Abraham. I mean, God, they know the promises that God had spoken over their lives. They know the, the promises that God had told their grandfather Abraham. I mean, this family is prosperous. This family, from the, from the outlook, from, from looking at it, you're going, they're stable. They're they're permanent. Like, this family has it all. This is the family that you're to model your family after. This is, this is the family to emulate. That's what Jacob's family looked like. I mean, come on. He has, he has four wives. You know, he has 12 boys. I mean, in, 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 minus the wife part, but I can't imagine, Right? But the 12 boys, like in his culture, he had everything. He was rich. He had the inheritance that he stole from Esau, right? Let's not talk about that. But, but from the outlook, he had everything. But deep down inside, there was something brewing that nobody saw. Jacob didn't see it. His sons didn't see it. But it was going to blow the top off his family, just like Mount St. Helen. See, in verse 3, we see it. We see where the Bible says, now Israel, and that's Jacob, the father of the family, he loved Joseph more than he loved his other sons. Now, we look at that and we go, what's so complex about that? What's so difficult about that? Well, you know, we all have our favorites, right? You have your favorite child, right? I won't tell you to, to point them out because your other child might be mad. But um, deep down inside, you know. Right, Gilbert? We know. I was not my mother's favorite. Not at all. Um, <clears throat> and as children, you think your children don't know. They know. They know. <laughs> you don't have to tell them. They just know. And, and so... I, as soon as I got done with this message, I had like three or four families come up to me and all the children go, Pastor, when you said that, we knew who, who the favorite was in the house, right? It's like, it's like when, you, when you want to counsel, uh, you do family counseling and, and, and you want to get the truth, right? You don't talk to the parents. No, you don't talk to the parents because they're going to be Mount St. Helen. Everything on the outside is going to look beautiful. It's going to look stable. It's going to look strong. You talk to the children, Right? That's who you talk to. You get, you get the children in the room, and you go, okay, let's talk about mom and dad. What do you see, right? And they, like, start unloading, right? And, and so it's, 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 it's the situation here. You look at it, and you go, how can, how can the love of a father towards a son actually be a, a, an inappropriate thing here? Well, let's unpack that, you know. The narrator is speaking of something that, that's very complex, very complex. Because you, when you look at Jacob's life, which we don't have the opportunity and the time today to kind of go back and look at his presuppositions and the filters of how he was raised. But I'm going to give you a nutshell. I'm going to kind of condense it as much as I can. Jacob grew up desperately lacking the love and the affirmation of his father, Isaac, because Isaac favored Esau. 
right? Because Esau, he's the hunter. He's the, he's the man's man. He's the one that goes out and builds things and he kills things. And, and in that day, that's the kind of son that you wanted, right? He's the firstborn. I mean, he's daddy's, he's daddy's, you know, he's daddy's pride and joy. And there's Jacob, man. He hangs out with mama. He's crocheting. He's learning how to cook, right? He gets the bake oven for Christmas. That's Jacob, right? Yeah. You don't know what the bake oven is, <laughs> you know? Don't act like you didn't get it or your sister got it and you wanted to play with it, right? So you, that's Jacob. And, and, I mean, he learns how to cook to the point where he convinces Esau to, to give up his inheritance to him. That was one mean soup. I mean, think about that. But that's Jacob. He's, he's longing for the love of his father. He's longing for, for affirmation. He's longing to be, to be a son that, that his father approves of. And so Jacob, his name is Trickster, right? And he goes and he tricks his father for the, for the right of the blessing that Esau should have had. Why? Because it created this, 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 this inappropriate need that Jacob had in his life. That's what Isaac did. And so Jacob, he projects that. He's looking for a wife, and he, he doesn't want Leah, although he marries Leah, right? He wants Rachel. He wants Rachel. And you can almost hear him in, his, in the story of his life. If I could just have Rachel, like, if I could just have Rachel, everything about my life would be perfect because she is just the woman of my dreams. How, how many of you men are married to your Rachel, right? If I could just have Rachel, like, oh, my life would be perfect. Do you kind of want to take that back now? Yes? No? Maybe? Some of you? Right? It's like... You, you ever do that in life? You ever, or you ever met someone that says, listen, if I had your job, my life would be so much better. I would have it made. If I had, if I had your husband, at least your husband cooks and he cleans and, and he does things around the house and he's not lazy, right? If I had your wife, at least she, she tends to my needs and, and, and she's going to do my laundry. She's going to cook and take care of the kids, right? You ever find yourself doing that? You ever find yourself or, or talking to your buddies or, or what, whoever it might be? It's like, man, if I drove your car, if I had, you know, if, if, if. I mean, that's what Jacob's doing here. It's like, if I could just have Rachel. So what did he do? He gets what his heart desires and he does have Rachel. And then he projects it onto his son, Joseph. And now Joseph, because Rachel dies. She, she dies there in birth of Benjamin. There's nothing there left to remind him, but but J Joseph and Benjamin, and, and he has this unhealthy attachment. Well, how, how, how can you see the unhealthy attachment? It's, it's there. The brothers hate Joseph because of the love of the father. They hate him. Why does he get to wear Prada and I have to wear Kmart? Right? Why does he get name brands? Why does he get the favor seat of the house? Why does he get all this stuff? But, but I'm having to do this. And Joseph knew it. He knew it. Here, let me pause there for a moment and bring it home for us. There, many years ago, I, I'm, I'm going to say probably about five or six years ago, Psychology Today, the magazine Psychology Today, did, a, did an article called Child Idolatry. This is, this is a secular view of what's happening in our culture, right? A secular view, not a Christian view, a secular view that, that there, the culture has created this inappropriate relationship between parent and children. And the inappropriate relationship, they call it child idolatry. So they worship their children. They're living vicariously through their children, right? They, and, and so they give their children everything they want. They, their children set the rules. The children set the, the, the climate in the house. Everything is run by the children, which is an inappropriate relationship, right? Here's, here's, one, here's one of the indicators, not the only indicator, but here's one of the indicators that you have an inappropriate relationship with your child right now at home. <clears throat> you refuse to discipline them. If you refuse to discipline your child, it's, it's inappropriate, right? Now, I don't mean discipline as you abuse them. I don't mean you get to go home, take off your belt, and start whipping them because they don't want to do what you ask them to do, right? That's not discipline, right? That, that's abuse, and that ought to be dealt with. If you're that type of parent, you shouldn't do that. 
But I'm talking about biblical discipline. I'm talking about when you ask your children to do something and they don't respond that you, you are afraid or you don't want to discipline them. <coughs> the Bible says that you should discipline your children. That if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. That if you don't discipline your children, that you hate yourself. Right? And the Bible is very strong about, about how we're to raise our children, the values we should have. In fact, to the point where even it, it flips on us as parents where you're not to provoke your children to wrath, right? And there's so much to uncover there, but you need to see how Jacob, he, he treated Joseph different. He treated Joseph different, and, and everyone, meaning the children, saw it. They knew it, and they, they were resentful for it. They were, they were embittered for it. They, and so what Jacob does is he makes Joseph his idol. Joseph is now the center and the purpose of his life. And you see that when, he, when, when Joseph, when they fake his death. You see it all the way through when Joseph even gets to the second, second position of power in Egypt. You still see the mourning of the father. He was an idol. And the result of it was that he poisoned his entire family system. The result of it, the other kids becomes, become these kids that, that, that resent and have this, this, this issue that's building up inside of them. And so we see because Jacob now idols, you know, uh, Joseph, he allows Joseph to act any way he wants. And so we see in verse 2, immediately, we see Joseph, what does he do? He brings a, a bad report to his father. Now, in the Hebrew, what that means when, it, when they say a bad report, it, it means a false report. It means a lie, a misrepresentation of what, what's really happening. And so here you have the narrator. He's immediately showing us, listen, this is Joseph. This is, this is his character. He's telling his father's lies about his brothers. He's telling his father all these reports that his brothers aren't doing. And you can see why they started to hate him. And, Joseph, and Jacob allowed it to happen. He allowed this behavior to continue. And so Joseph becomes a liar. He's a liar. Lying to his father. You know, it's a... And then he tells the dreams. I have this dream. He tells it to his brothers. And what do they do? They hate him for it. And he says, I have this other dream. And he tells it to his brothers and his dad at this point. They hate him even more for it. You know, at the very least, Joseph pathologically is insensitive to the surroundings of his brothers or the behavior that he has on other people. He's, 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 he doesn't care. He's becoming this arrogant person. He's becoming this, this cruel individual. And Jacob, remember, Jacob, who loves his son, begins to rebuke him. But it wasn't, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough because you can almost see, like, Joseph, when he's telling and retelling the dreams, it's, he, he, he's, he's incredibly hubilistic. He's, he's incredibly arrogant, incredibly overweening this story here. He, he's not taking into consideration how other people are perceiving what he's saying. He's just telling them. Why? Because it makes him look good. It makes him, because he's the one being worshipped. He's the one, he's the, he's the, the winner in the story. And so J Joseph is on this path, and Jacob refuses to do anything about it. Joseph is on this path to becoming a spoiled, selfish, insensitive, arrogant, and shallow person, even to the point where he, he might even become an evil person. But he's on that path. His brothers were already there. You see it four times or three times in, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 8. When he tells the story, what do they say? They hate him. They hate him even all the more. So the lava, it's brewing. No one sees it. This family from the outside looks great, looks strong, looks prosperous, but no one sees it. 
It's this facade of how we live our life, right? Looks really nice. Looks, looks like, man, I, I want to be like them. But on the inside, something's about to explode. Something's about to happen. Listen, the Bible, the purpose of, of the Bible stories aren't to teach us how to live good lives. That, that's not the purpose of the narrative, right? That, that's not the purpose of the Bible is to show you how to live a good life. That becomes very religious. It becomes very a, a to-do list. You do this and then you'll get this, right? It's, it's more of a relationship. The purpose of the Bible is, is, is God's grace breaking into our life and saving us from the sin that's hiding within, the sin and the brokenness in us. Otherwise, it will destroy us. It will overwhelm us. That's the purpose of the gospel, is God's grace coming into our life and rescuing us from the sin that's brewing inside. Rescue us from the, from the resentment and the hate and the, the greed and the selfishness that's all inside. That's the gospel. God's going to break in, and he's going to save us. So here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make. The application is every one of us, every one of us, there's hidden sin. There's issues in our heart. There's a brewing inside. There's, a, there, there's lava that's turning, that's ready to explode, that if it's not dealt with, if it doesn't, if it doesn't get confronted by the blood of Jesus, this, this inner sin, this unseen sin, then it's going to blow the top off of our life. It's going to ultimately destroy us and keep us from an eternal glory with Christ. That's what sin is going to do. That's the power of sin in our life. And we don't like to really address it. We don't really like to talk about those things that are really de deep, deep down inside of who we are as a person. We just, we want everything surface. We, we want to look like the mountain is together and it's stable and it looks good. But deep down inside, if we don't ever deal with it, it's going to explode. It's going to explode. Here's the second point that I want, I want you to see out of this narrative. is the unseen purpose of God. <clears throat> Under the surface is sin, but also under the surface is God at work. Is God at work. And, it, and it's hard to see, right? You look at the two dreams, which are very interesting to me. You, you, you put them in their, <coughs> in their historical context. Because if you don't, then, then the narrative makes no sense. You have to put the dreams in their historical context. And this is what I mean by that. They, Jacob and, and his sons lived in an ancient society, a very extreme male-controlled society. Now, women, don't be mad at me. I'm just telling you how it was in the Bible. It's not how we are today, right? Right? Not your husband. Like, this is just Bible time. It's not today. And so, and so there's, there's this culture that's already that's embedded in the sons. And the culture that's embedded in them is this, is this social structure that, that the younger of the family, the hierarchical of the family, never gets bowed to. Never. It's always the oldest. The oldest gets the inheritance. The oldest gets the estate. The oldest gets the blessing. The younger never gets bowed to, right? We learned that in, in David's day. They, were, they hated David because he was the younger. He should have never defeated the giant because he was the younger, right? It's the same thing here. He has these, these dreams, and in the dream, the younger is getting bowed to. The younger is getting worshipped, and, and in their culture, in their society, it, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. You, the younger is always going to bow to the older. Always going to do it. And we can understand that a little bit, being 99.9% .9 Hispanic here, right? The 1% of, of diversity is sitting on the front row, right? And um, that means she's white, if y'all don't know that. She, she acts Hispanic already. Oh, well, we got two over here. Y'all need to come with the 1%. One, one we get it. You know, we, at least I was raised that way. Like, grandpa, 
when grandpa came over, it didn't matter what mom and dad said. If grandpa said it, it was, it was you know, king of the, of the cultural family, right? The social uh, discourse, if you will. You know, if, and then it gets, it gets, you know, given down to dad. If dad speaks and everyone listens, right, kind of thing. And so I, I was raised that way. I have an older sister. When my older sister said something, we had to obey it. And if we didn't, when dad came home, we were in trouble. That's, that's how I was raised. And you can kind of understand that here in this culture, you know. I, and, and so, but you have to multiply it by 10. Because the culture was male-driven. And the dreams that Joseph had, they were so radically subversive to his, to his culture. Which made him, that's why it made them mad. You ever wonder why? Like, why are they mad at, at a dream? It's just a stupid dream. It makes no sense, right? It makes no sense to be mad at that. They were mad because you, you add the dream on top of his arrogant, his arrogant behavior because he was the favor of, of the father. Well, then you can see Joseph's position. You can see why he lorded it over them. So what does God do through the dream? He brings salvation to this family. He brings salvation through the youngest. And, the, and, and he brings it through a way that, that, that is so subversive to the culture of his day. And you can almost see that in Jesus' time too, and how Jesus comes into this world and he comes into a manger, and no one will ever think that the, that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, you know, is going to be born in a manger. How does a king enter that way? And so the story unfolds. You have all these, these moments that happen in the story, these coincidences, if you will. You know, so, so let me unpack this. Like, Joseph is sent to his brothers, and, and he's going down to Shechem to go check on his brothers. And, and on the way to Shechem, he, he runs into a stranger. And the stranger tells him, well, your brothers are not at Shechem. They're at, they're at uh, Doranth and, 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 and Dueth, excuse me. I'm not even saying that word. Doreth. Dotha. Where is it at? It's Dotha, right? There, he's down. I should have put in my notes. He's down at, they're down at Dotha. And, and, and so that's where your brothers are. And, and so when you think about it, like, is it a coincidence that, that Jacob or Joseph runs into this stranger and his, the stranger knows where the brother is? Or, and, and it just doesn't make sense, right? But I don't believe in coincidence. I don't think the Bible teaches coincidence. Not at all. There was a series of things that had to happen. He's sent by his father. And instead of being in Shechem, he's at, he's at, he's at Dorth, Dorthin, right? Something like that. We'll just call it Vegas. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It was that kind of city. Like, no one knew because it was so small. No one knew what was going to happen. But they were already in their heart plotting to kill their brother. So when he gets there, what happens? They strip him of his robe, and they beat him, and they throw him into a well, and they leave him for half dead. And what else happens? They, they decide, you know what? Let's not kill him. Let's sell him off as a slave. And so he's now being sent to Egypt. What else happens? They plot his murder so they can tell their father this is what happened to Joseph. And so all this sinister, this 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 malice, all this sinful brewing inside these people now explodes. It now happens. You see, if you don't deal with it, it'll come out. You might think it won't. You might think you can contain it, you can control it. If you don't deal with it, it's going to explode. That's why it needs to be confronted by the blood of Jesus. Here's, here's the point of, of those coincidences, those things that, that, that seem like they didn't, they just happened to happen, right? The point is that every single little detail, every one of these coincidences couldn't just have been coincidence because if any of them didn't happen, if they 
he didn't run into the stranger so that he could go where his brothers really were because he was on his way to Shechem. If, if his brothers didn't take his robe and didn't throw him into the well, if none of that happens, then the entire family dies. The entire family dies. Not only does the family die, but tens of thousands of other people die. And not only do tens and thousands of other people die, but Benjamin dies. And if Benjamin dies, what happens? Then the lineage of our Savior, the the way that God is going to come into the world, has died. And we look at Joseph's life and we go, how can they do that? How can all that happen? How can God allow it to happen? And and here's the point, the unseen purposes of God. You, You have to know that every little detail needed to happen so that people can be saved. God, he seems completely, completely absent on the surface. Haven't haven't heard of him. There's no mention that the dream was from God. There's no mention about God. There is no mention. It's not like they were strangers to the Lord because, after all, this is the heritage of Abraham. They knew the covenant that their grandfather, he was, he was, he was, they were one, one parent removed from Abraham. It wasn't like he was the great, 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 great grandfather of, of, of Abraham. No. I mean, they knew. They had direct access. They knew. He was in every detail. Even though God is not on the page, you don't see him mentioned. You don't see what's, uh, any mention of him, any, any alluding to him. But he is in every detail. All the chaotic processes, all the awful things, all the terrible things that's happened to Joseph. God is in the midst of it. It doesn't make sense. But he's arranging. He's arranging the salvation of Joseph's family. He's arranging the salvation of all the thousands of people in Egypt. He's arranging the salvation of you and me today in this story, in this story. So so what do we learn? We learn this, that God's wise, redeeming love is completely compatible with the terrible things in your life. I know we don't like to look at it that way, and, and it seems almost like, like we're almost preaching heresy because, because we're so used to hearing from the pulpits of America. We're so used to hearing where, where you, have, you have the blessed life this way, and then you have the terrible, sinful life this way. And if you are not blessed and you're not see, receiving all the good things of God, then you must be on this other path. But I'm here to tell you that in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your rebelliousness, in the midst of all the times that you're rejecting God, God is behind the scene and he's working out every single little detail of your life. That's what we get from the narrative, that you cannot run from God, you can't hide from God. He knows everything that's going on in your life. Listen, little Johnny that's rebellious right now, it doesn't surprise God. Listen, your marriage that's on the brink right now, it doesn't surprise God. The financial situation that you got yourself into, it doesn't surprise God. You got to know that he's in the very detail of your life. He's there. So when Joseph came to his brothers and they stripped him of his robe and they took and they threw him into the, into the well and they left him there for dead and then they sell him. Listen, the Hebrew word for throw is not like you're just throwing some ball. No, there's this, there's this connotation where, where you have stripped this animal and you've left them from, for dead. That's what they did with Joseph. And we don't see it in the 37th chapter of Genesis, but in the 42nd chapter, you see Joseph crying out. You see that he's he's begging for salvation. He's begging for help. He's saying, someone help me. Someone get me out of here. He's crying out to God, right? He's crying out in the midst of his darkness. Looks violent. Why does it have to be so brutal? They, They seized him and they did all these 
these wicked things to him. Why? Because on the outside, it looked great. The family looked good. The family was stable. But on the inside, no one saw what was brewing. But it's there. It's a great image of humanity today. We look good on the outside. But what's brewing on the inside? What are you letting incubate in your heart? Just sitting there. Is it resentment? Is it lust? Is it anger? What is it? Because it's there. Only because Joseph is rejected. Only because Joseph is sold into slavery. Only because all these awful things happen will Joseph himself be saved from the pride that he was going, that he was allowing in his life. Only because these things happen, listen, the brothers will be saved from their hatred and their resentment towards their brother Joseph. Only because these things happen, Jacob begins to now deal with the fact that his son was an idol in his heart. Do, do you see the, the chain of events that are happening here? And, and I know we, we're like, well, the story doesn't have to be so brutal. Like, like what if God could just, just send down an angel? And he just sent down an angel and he shows up to Jacob's family. He says, he says Jacob, listen, listen, Jacob, because your boys, they're, they're going down the wrong path. Because you're treating Joseph so different, you're creating this resentment in your boys. You're creating this poison in them. You need to see that. Wake up, Joseph. I mean, Jacob. Joseph, you're taking advantage of your father's love, and you're mistreating your brothers, and you're taking advantage of how he treats you, and you're lording it over your brothers. You need to stop that. Hey, brothers, listen. Don't be so resentful. Don't hate your brother. Jacob loves you too. It would have been so easy. Everyone would have been smitten. Everyone would have had this kumbaya moment. They would have, they would have come together and it said, man, thank God for sending that angel. Because if he wouldn't have sent that angel, then we would have never had this, this repentive moment. But no, it didn't happen that way. Because sending an angel is not going to change how they were going to behave. If God sent an angel today, it wouldn't change how you behave. Well, sure I would, Pastor. I would change in a heartbeat. Well, he sent an angel to Sodom and Gomorrah. He not only sent one, but he sent three. And did it, they change? Did they repent unto the Lord? No. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to rape the angels. They wanted to sexually abuse the angels. Listen, don't, don't think if God will do something that you will absolutely change. Because no one has ever changed because God, because they were told that God loves them. They were changed because they were shown that God loves them. They needed, they needed this. Listen, centuries later, down at Dothan, you have the story of Elijah, the prophet, and his servant. And the same place where they beat and abused Joseph, Dothan, there is, is this place where now Elisha is about to be overtaken by the enemy of the Lord. And his servant is scared. He's like, hey, do something, prophet. And so he, he, says, and he says this prayer, right? And then the prayer, he opens the eyes of his servant, and his servant looks to the hills, and he realizes that there's more with them than they are with the, the, the natural army, right? And then all of a sudden, chariots of fire come, and God delivers Elisha. You're like, why can't God do that to Joseph? Right? It makes sense. It's in the same city. And, and they both pray. They both cry out. Why doesn't God he, deliver Joseph like he does Elisha? Well, here's, here's one reason. Elisha didn't need spiritual healing. He needed physical salvation. And so God delivers Elisha. But if God was to deliver Joseph the way he did Elisha, listen, he would come out of the well and he would return back to his father, the same arrogant, spoiled, insensitive human being that he was growing up to be. The brothers would have continued to hate him even more because this would have been the story of Jacob. Jacob would have been like, the Lord loves Joseph 
because he's the favorite, and now all of a sudden the cycle repeats itself. No, it wouldn't have been the same if you sent an angel. Because there was, inter- there was internal healing that needed to happen. There was internal recalibrating, if you will, in the hearts of Jacob and Joseph and the brothers. They all had this issue running through them, and it finally exploded. You see, Joseph actually had to be lost to be saved. He actually had to hit rock bottom. He had to go on the journey. God was caring as much for Joseph in his silence as he was caring for Elijah in his dramatic rescue of him and his servant. Just we don't like to see it that way. Look, it's throughout Scripture. Peter gets thrown in prison. The saints of God prays and pray, God, pray to God to deliver him. What happens? The, the prison doors open, right? John the Baptist gets thrown in prison. His disciples pray to God. What happens to John the Baptist? Gets beheaded. Are you telling me God is with one and not the other? Absolutely not. God is still with both. He's sovereign. He, he knows the story from beginning to end. God is still working in both situations. If you know that, if you know that God is still working in your tragedy as much as he's working in, in, your, in, in the favors and the blessings that you have in this world, you would be different. You'd be stronger. D- did you get that? Listen, listen, God has a plan for his people. He has a plan for Joseph's family to be saved. He has a plan for all of Egypt to be saved. He has a plan to save the lineage of Jesus. God has a plan. And in Joseph's story, nowhere do you see Joseph going, this is God's plan to save the future of humanity. No, because he doesn't know. He's just taking it as is, face value. I had a dream. You're going to bow down to me. Great. Now you have to worship me. That's Joseph. But God's plan was like, yes, Joseph, they're going to bow to you, but I'm going to take you through a situation that's going to carve out the lust, that's going to carve out the pride, that's going to deal with your arrogance, that's going to deal with your your, your stubbornness. I'm going to take you through that so I can put you in a position so that you can have authority to make the right decision. I need to take you through that so that you can be saved. God has a plan for his people. And if you truly believe what what Paul writes, he says, he says that everything works, everything works for good for those who love the Lord. Everything. If you truly believe that, If you truly believe that in your tragedy, in your chaos, and everything that the enemy meant for evil, God turns for good. If you truly believe that, then you'll be stronger. You'll be stronger. Doesn't mean we won't hurt. I'm not minimizing life's hurts. I'm not minimizing life's pain. I'm not giving excuse for parents to abuse their children. I'm not giving excuse for children to be rebellious against their parents. I'm not giving you excuse to sin against God. What I am telling you, in the midst of your folly, in the midst of our foolishness, in the midst of us rejecting God, that God has every detail organized and planned out that no matter what you do, that God will see you through it, that nothing can save separate you from the love of God. There's no demon. There's no height. There's no death. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. That God loves you. And if you truly believe that, then you will be stronger. You will be wiser. You'll be richer. You'll be able to sustain the heartaches of life. You won't look at suffering anymore and you won't go, why is God letting this happen? 
You won't allow that question to penetrate your heart because you know that everything works for good to those that love the Lord. Joseph's coat, his coat, though it was something that brought this hatred out of his brothers because they wanted to be loved like that. That's all it was. They wanted dad to look at them and go, I love you just as much. I care for you just as much as I care for Joseph. But he didn't do it for whatever reason. But the coat, is a, it's a real symbolic picture here of, of the love of the father. That that coat, when Joseph wore it, and they saw Joseph wearing the coat, they knew that it was the favor of the father on his life. And Jacob shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. I need you to know, centuries later, there comes one who was sent to his own and was not received. He was sold for silver. He was beaten. He was stripped naked. He was treated as a criminal more than Joseph could ever, ever endure. Jesus becomes the ultimate Joseph. I need you to see this. I need you to see that, and I, I shared this with you when we started the, the narrative of David. In order, in order for the narrative to have the gospel power in it, you have to find Jesus in it somewhere. Or else it just becomes a good moral story. It becomes, it becomes this, this story that draws ethical lines for us and say we should not cross. But that, that there's more to the narrative than that. You have to understand that later we see one whose name is Jesus who is beaten and who was sold and who was treated just the way Joseph was. But to a greater point, to beyond what Joseph had ever cried out, beyond the pain that Joseph would have ever received, Christ endured it. Joseph, it was not voluntary, but Jesus abdicated his throne voluntarily to say, Father, if you have a plan to redeem your creation, I will obey what you have. And he abrogates his throne and he comes down to, to earth in a manger and he is now here to tell us that God loves us. But he's not just here to tell us God loves us. He's here to show us God loves us because no one ever changes because they were told to do something. They changed because they were shown that they were loved. Jesus not only said, God loves you, but I'm going to prove to you that he loves you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to hang on the cross when everybody turns their back on me, when the Father turns his face away from me. I'm showing you the love of God. It was demonstration, as Paul says, that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross. It was a demonstration of how much God loves us. Why does he do it? Why, why does he do that? Why does he go to great extremes? Because he sees what's brewing on the inside. He knows. We can be sanctimonious. We can act self-righteous. We can act like I have everything together. But if he didn't send his son to invade your sin, we would explode. And we would destroy our lives. We would destroy our lives. And we've tried. If we're to survey your heart, we've tried. 
the sin has exploded a few times. We've tried to destroy what God has wanted good for us. And we do our own thing and go our own way. And we're like, why did I do that? It's because it's brewing. The blood of Christ. Wants to encounter. Wants to invade your heart. That's the grace of God. I'm done. You gave me to 2 o'clock. I'm done. I'm going to end with this. What do you need from God? You, you, you don't need answers. You don't need answers to why your tragedy, to why your chaos and the hurt in your life. You're like, no, pastor, I do need answers. I would, I would function better. That's, that's to say that you would see the whole story. If God gave you an answer to why you're suffering right now, it would just create more questions because you don't see the whole story of your life. Here, here let me illustrate it this way. Giving you an answer to why they're suffering in your life is like trying to explain to a, a five-year-old how to get into college. You're wasting your breath. It's too complex. God telling you why you're suffering is too complex. You don't know. You look at Joseph's story and it's brutal. You need to really reflect on this later because we only have an hour, right? I had it, I was been, I've been talking for an hour. We, that's not long enough for you to understand how much hatred there's, there are in, this, in, in these siblings. Can you imagine killing your own sibling? Can you imagine stripping them of their clothes and putting them in a well? Can you imagine selling them off as a slave? Like, you, you have to understand the, the, the details of this, of this narrative. It, it's not just, oh, they, they didn't like Joseph. No, they loathed Joseph. He repelled them. It's not a pretty story. But Joseph's life as brutal as it is, God's in the midst of it. As, as much harm as the brothers thought that they were going to bring into his life, only catapulted him to his destiny. The devil thinks all this stuff he's bringing into your life, all this chaos, he, listen, truly believe that all things work for good for those that love the Lord, then you're stronger. You're wiser. It hurts to go through it, but I know somewhere in this journey of mine, God's got it all worked out. He's got it all worked out. So you're here today. I believe, not because of coincidence, because everything has to happen in your life in order to get you to where God wants you to be, right? And maybe there's things brewing in you that you haven't dealt with. Resentment and unforgiveness, greed or lust, whatever it is that's brewing, I'm here to tell you, not dealt with it's going to explode it's going to it's going to be tangible somewhere